for this appearance. Yeah, I know. I was just wondering the same thing. <laughs> we're, talking about, we're talking about fasting on Tuesday. I'm going to go store up now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Who's left out there? Yes, Joan. Heard them in. Go we'll turn the lights out on everybody. <laughs> That's enough of fellowship. So, all right, now y'all know what I'm going to ask you, don't you? Can we, do we just want to move in? Can we move in? I mean, it just feels like so, I don't know. It's a lot of extra work for my neck. Uh, I like move my eyes all the way from here to over there. It's very hard. It's very hard. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, if, if you don't want to all move to the center, then what you have to do is start convincing people to stay. Because the more people that are here, then, you know. It's the cold, it's the air conditioner. Yeah, everyone likes to. Well, if you want, listen, we can come to this section if everyone wants. So we can come over here. Like, oh. <laughs> I tried. You see, see, this is. This is just further evidence that you can't please everybody, and chances are you can't please anybody. Hey, what you guys? I saved the entire front row for you guys. <laughs> All right. So here's here's what I would like to do, and we will uh, we will stay for as. Uh, either for the, the entire 45 minutes or we'll just stay for as long as it takes. Um, but I'd like to start with questions, maybe around fasting. Um, and then if when, when we're done with the questions, I'd uh, like to move into a time of just considering some specific things to be praying about um, as, we, as we move into 2024. And, uh, and are continuing the 21 days of prayer. I um, hope you're finding that helpful. I've heard from a few people this week uh, who have been encouraged and aided by the daily reminder um, to pray. So much so that it's like it's one of those things like, man, you, you almost wish you could do it all the time. Um, but that's probably not going to happen. So uh, probably 21 days and that'll be it. Um, unless we just set up a constant reminder like, like every day, 
an email that will go out that just says pray in all caps exclamation point uh, and then leave it to you but hopefully you're taking advantage of that I trust it's being an encouragement to you uh, as I know it has been to some others um, let me pray just to start us off and then uh, see what questions you might have God we ask for your guidance even in this hour uh, Lord we dare not approach your scripture without um, without asking for your help uh, recognizing how much we need it I so we pray that you will supply it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm open it up to you. Questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, so, so he does. There, Jesus fasted prior to the beginning of his earthly ministry. And then it appears once he begins that public ministry, that ends. And, and I don't know, like, it's never explained fully as to why that might be. So we kind of have to uh, conjecture a little bit here. But I'm, I'm assuming that at least in part was because the public demonstration of his ministry was the, the declaration that the king had come, the bridegroom had come. To personally prepare himself for that, um, he was seeking the Lord, uh, withstanding temptation. And so he made, um, for his own benefit, he made fasting part of his, uh, what we could probably assume part of his routine up until that point. But as he's traveling through Israel in this public display of God has come, and, and the focus then seems to be on uh, the, the glory of the kingdom of God has broken into our world. And so rather than fasting, we have healings. Uh, we have feedings, right? Uh, feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. Um, so Jesus is intent on his public ministry displaying the, the arrival of the king and his kingdom breaking into reality and, and that's why there was there would be no fasting uh, during that period. Now, I, I will say, though, interesting, I, I kind of contemplated this a little bit last night, and I'm not sure this 100% fits, but if we take the definition of fasting that, um, that Martin Lloyd-Jones gave us, that, that fasting is doing without any legitimate body, you know, function or desire, and just kind of saying no to that for a time, then then I don't know that it's entirely inappropriate to look at um, some of Jesus' prayer habits where he would seemingly go out all night and pray um, or give up a significant amount of sleep in prayer. Uh, and so part of me wonders if, if that is not in some way a fast, to go, I'm going to do without this bodily need of sleep in order to pursue the Lord for strength or direction. Um, but again, that was something he was doing uh, seemingly privately, uh, going off by himself to seek the Lord for his own personal well-being. But certainly the public display of his ministry was the joyful arrival of the king and his kingdom. And, uh, and this is why he says, by the way, um, the, the, the Son of Man has come to you. you know, John the Baptist came to you neither eating nor drinking. And, and you thought he was a weirdo, right? But, but the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, right? Like, I am celebrating, and you call me a, a, a glutton and a drunkard, right? Um, so so he, his ministry had a very different feel even than John the Baptist. Uh, he was meeting in people's houses, and they were eating. There was a celebratory feel. Um, to his ministry, which is probably why it was so attractive on top of the, the, the healings and the miracles, the, the curiosity that surrounded him. Um, there was this growing sense of, man, this is, like, this is the guy, right? And, and we are celebrating his arrival. And that all culminates ultimately at the triumphal entry where they're breaking off branches and, and, and they're shouting, Hosanna, right? Glory to God in the highest. Why? The king has come. Um, they remember the Old Testament prophecy. The king has arrived and he enters into Jerusalem on a colt, um, on, a, on a donkey. And so Jesus fulfills that prophecy there in full-on celebratory mode. So to the point that the, 
the, the Pharisees, who are just ravaged with jealousy at this point, are like, Jesus, tell them to stop. You know, this, 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 is, not, this is not good, it's not right. And Jesus is like, hey, look, if they stop crying, the rocks themselves will cry out. Why? Because the king has arrived. And all of creation recognizes that the arrival of the king means joy. Right? And an exuberant expression of that joy. Does that, does that answer your question? Partially, mostly? Yeah. Good question. One that I thought about a little bit last night, particularly in conjunction with the, the sleep thing. What else? What are the questions that we have? Either about Mark 2 itself or fasting, what it is, what it means, why we do it. How we do it. Good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And I know, so I, I'll say a couple things about that. Like, number one, uh, I, yeah, I get it. Like, I, I feel like I, I get sucked into that very easily. Uh, I, re- I I heard someone the other day say, uh, you know, if you can't move from one room in your house to the other without wondering where your phone is, you have an addiction. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, I, like if, if, I, if I walk into the kitchen, I'm like, oh, where, where, did, where did I put my phone? Like, and I got to go find my phone before I feel like I can do anything else because it's got to be there. And and you start to wonder like why is that like this thing this thing very easily um, sends out its its you know it just it just pulls us in right it just it just controls us um, the second thing the, the second thought I had about that is I know a lot of people hear us talk about this and it comes up on a fairly regular basis and it's becoming more and more a topic of conversation even out in the world but I know there are a lot of people who who kind of hear us and go like. It's like, like we sound like we sound like the old guy on the front porch, you know, get off my lawn kind of guy. Like if everything just wasn't the way it always, you know, you know, the good old days kind of, you know, if if everyone was just out like eating mud and swinging on vines, we'd all be a whole lot better, like we were as kids, right? Uh, the world would be a better place. Well, the world is is probably not going back to that. Um, and 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 generationally, changes happen, right? Uh, the phone is here; it is part of our reality. Um, but we should, uh, again, I go back to Paul's statement, meats for the belly and belly for meats, right? There are good things in this world, like food, like phones. Listen, th- this is with me all the time, but partially because this is my connection to you. Um, and, and so I can I can do a lot of work on this. Um, I've written sermons on this thing. Um, it, it's not easy. I don't necessarily like it, but it's possible. Right, I, I can study using that. I can I can have more access to more study material on my phone than than many pastors around the world would have ever had in their library. Uh, it, it's absurd, really. So so this can be a really really good gift. But here's here's the thing: um, good gifts can often become the biggest deterrent to our own spirituality. Right? Let, let me repeat that. Good things can often be our biggest problem when it comes to our own spirituality, our own walk with the Lord. See, for, for people who are Christians, right, like we're trying to do good, we're trying to do right, and we're generally pretty good at being on guard against the bad things, right? 
I mean, I would genuinely be surprised if any of you went out of here and just murdered somebody, right? Like, I don't expect murder to be a problem. That's not going to be the thing, the thing that derails it. Maybe a couple of you, but keep my eye on it, right? But it's the good thing. Why? Because the good things, because they're good, they're very subtle. Good things can very easily become ultimate things. They can very easily become too important, too necessary. And so, and so I, I, I start with something that is good, and because it's good, I drop my guard with it, and before I know it, um, that good thing kind of becomes a bit of a god for me. And that's what's behind the sin of gluttony, right? Food, good thing. God says, by the way, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, God is like, what, what, is, what is it for man to do? He's like, you want me to tell you? He's like, Here, here's what you should do. You should eat. And you should drink. And you should enjoy work. Right? Huh. Right? God is not asking us to like flog ourselves every day and be miserable people. You know, no, there are good things in this world I've given you. My, my desire for you is to enjoy life to its fullest. Right? But the problem is, we take those gifts that are intended for our good and we turn them into something that is controlled. And, and listen, a lot of those things, like like our flesh, is very willing to comply, right? Um, th there are things that send off signals to our brain. I was having a discussion on Tuesday with a recovery class um, that we meet, and we were just we we're talking about the fact that um, you know, the the Bible has long recognized that men can be double-minded, right? Remember James, double-minded man is unstable as all, in all his ways. You know what a double-minded man is? It's a person that's like, I, I, I want to serve God, and I'm going to serve God, but I also want uh, whatever it is. I want earthly pleasure, and I want to pursue that too, right? We're, we're split. Our loyalties are divided. Well, science has started to catch up a little bit, and science now says that we are all basically double-minded in some way. That there is this central part of our brain that is called the reward center. Uh, some, some people call it the, the Homer Simpson part of the brain. It's the part that just is like, we don't think, we just do, right? If, if I crave something, I just, I just go after it, right? Because I want the reward of whatever that thing is promising me, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even think about the consequences, right? It's the part of me that looks at a box of uh, hot Krispy Kreme glazed donuts that just came off the conveyor belt, right? And goes, one, are you kidding me? Half dozen, and then we'll talk, right? Um, it's part of the. I don't want. I don't want to consider how it's going to make me feel later. I just want the reward now, right? And, and then there's the second part of our brain that, that tends to light up around uh, ideas of control and moderation and and thinking through planning and and, and it's, that's the frontal lobe. And so uh, again, science has shown people that have injuries to this front part of your brain you tend to lose all ability to control your behavior. It becomes much more difficult. So, so science is starting to tell us, hey, there, there are these parts of our brain that all kind of work together. But there are things that tend to hijack the brain. And things like, like, I mean, the most extreme example here is, uh, is, is opiate drugs, right? When, when you do them, they create a reward in your brain. There's a dump of dopamine. There's, it's doing all kinds of things to the physical parts of your brain that your brain goes, oh, I kind of like that, right? And then because it likes it, it tells you, I, hey, you remember that thing that felt so good? We, we want that again. And then the more, the more you give it, the more it moves from, hey, it's not only do I want this, but I need it. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to make you miserable, right? And, and, and people who start to give themselves to that, all of a sudden, your sense of normalcy becomes completely skewed. Feeling normal is being high. That extra dump of dopamine, and all of a sudden your brain stops producing it on its own. It's completely dependent on what you're feeding it through the illicit drug. And so then when you don't give it the drug, you're stuck. And, and your brain is going, ah, right? Where is it? This is what we call withdrawal, right? Now you're going to feel miserable. I'm going to make you sick. 
Because you're not giving me what I want. Right? And we don't feel normal. We feel bad when we don't have it. Right? So here's the interesting thing. To bring this full circle. Science is now showing very similar effects on the brain to, to what, what, these, what these opiates do compared to what phones and digital media do, particularly with young kids. It lights up the reward center of your brain. And it's giving immediate gratification, immediate reward, immediate dopamine hit, which then creates a craving. Which, if given, then produces this felt need. I have to have it. And if I don't get it, I feel it, right? I don't feel normal. So I, I have to have more of it. See, it, it, I mean, again, nothing, nothing wrong with, I mean, drugs can be used for healing purposes. They can be used for, for good. Um, screens can be used for good. TV can be used for good. Food can be used for good. But we can take all of those things and we can misuse them until they become a danger to us, until they have completely warped our sense of reality. And all of a sudden, the idea of going 24 hours without checking Facebook, like I just break out in a cold sweats, right? Like I go, oh, I'm, what am I going to do, right? Uh, or the feeling of I'm just going to be so bored, I'm going to be so unfulfilled. But here's, here's the little secret behind it all. Here's the dirty little reality, and here's why uh, we say often that there is a great comparison between the addictions of the modern age and the gods of ancient times, right? But because what are they? The, the gods of the ancient times were human constructs that were intended to provide for humans something we felt we needed and weren't getting enough. We, we were afraid we are going to do without. So if we want better crops, let's, let's make a god and let's pray to that god. Let's sacrifice that god so that we have better crops and more rain or whatever it is. <clears throat> what is modern addiction? Modern addiction is taking a felt need and looking around and trying to find something to fill that need. But when you do that, you become slave to the item that is filling that need. Right? So the ancients became slaves to their gods. Um, we become slaves to our habits, to our behavior, to our cravings. Um, but we are, we are the same people, right? Uh, we're doing the same thing. Just our gods aren't made out of wood and gold and shaped like an image. Uh, our gods are screens and, and you know, uh, substances or entertainments or people, right? We, we make our gods out of other things. Uh, but they, 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 uh, we, we then become slaves to the gods we create. So... Although I could not right now tell you how in the world we got to that point of the conversation, um, I, I will say that one of one of the benefits of fasting is it does help bring cravings under control. If we were just to step up, and there, there is a ton of spiritual impact to that. And I think it is a perfectly legitimate thing to go, God, this thing is so important to me. I'm afraid it's too important. I'm going to put it aside, right? I'm going to give it up. And there's something in, in the doing of that, particularly if our heart is then bent toward pursuing the Lord, that there's something in that that I believe helps to break the power of that addiction. It proves to us that we can do without it, and it also proves to us that God is better than whatever this thing is, Right? Because here's the dirty little secret behind it all. And you guys, if you've ever pursued anything like this, you, you, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. When you pursue something else in place of God, a substance, another person, uh, you know, Netflix, like whatever it is, and you just binge on that thing, it feels good for a little while. And then what happens? After a while, it just kind of doesn't do what it used to do, does it? And as a matter of fact, if you continue in it, not only will it not do what it used to do, but it's going to start to feel like it's boring a hole right through your soul. And if you're paying attention, you're, you're going to hear this little voice in the back of your head going, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like, is this all there is to life? Like, I can't think of anything more significant to do than this. 
And man, then the ache is going to set in. And, and, and we're so poor at listening to those little warning signals. We're, we're so bad at, at not only listening, but understanding what the answer is that we will turn to the very thing that's creating those feelings and ask that thing to fix it. And we're like, what I need is just to double down. What I need is more Netflix. What I need is more screen time. What I need is, is more of the illicit drug, alcohol, whatever it is. And, and, and that's when the spiral starts, right? Um, and we just, we're oblivious to the fact that we are pursuing what is our own death, right? Either literally, physically, perhaps, with drugs or alcohol, or emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, with virtually anything else. So there is a, there is a genuine benefit to our humanity just to go, I'm going to put this thing aside. And, and then, when, when you put it aside and you pursue God, here's the thing. And I, and I would just, I will ask you, because some of you are looking at me going, mm, I'm not so sure. Uh, it, that, that's how you're going to respond to this. But I'm just going to ask you to hear what I have to say, and then just just try it, okay? Can, can I just ask you, just, just try it. If it doesn't work, fine. You can call me a liar, right? Um, put it down. Fast. Pursue God. Through Christ, through his word, and see if he is not better than the thing you just picked up. Right? Just, just see. If he does not, if he is not able to satisfy you better than whatever this other thing is over here that you're giving yourself to. Because he promises, right? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just, just taste it. Just try me, right? This is why he says, at my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In, in other words, with me, there is there's no reason why you would ever feel empty or lost. I am, I am full life to you. This is why Jesus says to those who would save their life. He says, I just, I just want to hang on to it. I want to do anything and everything that pleases me. If that's your pursuit, one day you're going to look around and go, what have I been doing? And realize that you completely lost. But, he says, if you're willing to give up your life for me, then you're going to find it, right? I mean, how, how subversive is that idea, right? I mean, it just takes everything we thought we knew about life and living and just turns it on its head, doesn't it? Because what we think is life is just, just, just do it. Right? If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart, Disney World, right? Right? And there, find the meaning of life. Wrong, right? Jesus says, if you follow your heart like that, you're going to look around one day and go, what is this all about? What, what is this? But if by his help you reign in your heart and you, you direct it to him, He's like, then you're going to look around and go, this is eternal life. This is life worth living. This is life to the fullest. Um, there's my challenge. Go, ah, I don't know. The challenge is try it. Try it. This is one of those ways where I think you can put the Lord to the test, and he will gladly answer. Right? I mean, he invites this. Try me. Test me. But the kind of testing he doesn't like is the faithless kind of testing. The kind that comes to him and just is like, I don't like you. I don't like what you're doing. 
why won't you give me what I want? And really all we're doing is just voicing our faithlessness. But it's that, hey God, I'm coming. And I have to admit, I got some doubts. But I hear what you've had to say about yourself. And I've tried everything else down here. Nothing else seems to work. And I want to come. But it's a little scary. And it's a little intimidating. And I'm, and I'm just not sure. I think that's the kind of little faith that God is like, man, just, just try me. Just try me. And see if I am not good. See if I'm not better than anything else you've given yourself to. Um, okay. What else? Yes, sir. Hundred percent. I appreciate that, and, and that was really, I think, part of uh, part of Jesus' point when he talks about fasting. Um, your motivations do really matter. They, they, they do matter, and and we can we can set aside and kind of willpower our way to basically any kind of fast we want for any purpose we want. Um, but what makes a fast uniquely Christian is the motivation behind it. What what am I seeking to gain? And listen, I think there's, there are physical, real life benefits to limiting virtually every good thing in our life, right? Uh, you, you can turn on a number of podcasts today and hear people preach about the benefits of fasting for your mental health, for your physical health. Uh, we, we can do all of that and still miss the benefit that Christ is holding out to us. And that does have to do with why are you pursuing it? And I think the evidence of why shows up in what you do when you're fasting. Right? Because if I'm fasting, but I'm not actively pursuing the Lord, I'm, I'm not taking that time to actually pray more than I usually would or, or to, to read the Scripture more, uh, to, to think about it more. If I'm not doing that, then it betrays the motivation, doesn't it? I, I, I've betrayed uh, myself. I might have said I wanted to pursue the Lord, but in reality, this is more about self-discipline or becoming a better person or growing as a man, like whatever it is. Uh, but the motivation is not to know the Lord. And that's the challenge that Christ is laying in front of us. Do you want me? Do you want me? Because like we said, just being a better person isn't good enough. The, the gospel makes that abundantly clear. You can never be good enough. So why don't we stop spinning your wheels in that track and instead turn to the Christ, turn to the Messiah, who can not only forgive your sins, but credit his righteousness, his goodness to your account, right? Uh, yeah, thank you for that reminder. That's good. Anything else? Huh? Okay. Um, yeah. 
Well, I, I think that's, um, that's very similar to the psalm um, that we read this morning that says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, right? Like there's a, there's a breaking of fellowship um, if we choose to disobey God or his law, that there's a breaking of that fellowship. Um, in the context of Proverbs 9, and, and we kind of have to understand Proverbs is, Proverbs lays out for us really two ways to live life, right? And it's looking at life that if everything is as it is supposed to be, then this is what you can expect will happen. Um, and so in 28.9, when he says, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Um, and, and because if I turn away from hearing the law, then again, I'm betraying the true condition of my heart. Because if I turn away from the law, I am essentially turning away from God himself. If, if I don't love your law, then I don't really love you either, right? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a package. And so I think what, what he's trying to get at here is that those who turn away and reject the law of God really don't love God either, and God is under no obligation to those people to hear and answer their prayer. The, their prayer then, as a, uh, let me say this and I'll, I'll let you follow up. Their prayer as an abomination then, I would say, is in this sense, that you are praying to God even though you despise him. That, that's, an, that's abominable hypocrisy, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think I think that I think Proverbs twenty eight nine is different than what you're saying. So I, I think for the believer who comes to Christ, you're not going to have everything figured out. I don't have everything figured out, right? Um, but God's grace, the the blood of Christ, has covered all of my transgressions, right, including uh, my misunderstandings and the things I might not be fully theologically aligned with yet, or uh, even the uh, the misconceptions I might have even about prayer or, or how to pray. Um, there's an aspect of this where sometimes we come to the Lord and, and it's the Spirit who gives utterance to our heart because I don't know what to pray, right? Uh, so I think that is different um, than someone who's like, God, right? All these laws and rules, right? What right does he have? Or These are, these are so old-fashioned. I don't want anything to do with these. Oh, God, please help me, right? Right, and then all of a sudden you're in trouble. And it's like, oh, you know, help me get this job. I'll do anything, right? God was like, that's an abomination, right? You don't want me. All you want is for your life to be easy. Um, I, I think, does that make sense? There, there's a little difference. And in some ways, I guess we can come back to the, the, the point about motivation. Like, like, what are you really motivated by? I think this prayer of the abominable, uh, what he is saying is that those people are not motivated by wanting God or from hearing from God. They're motivated, what can I get? But I don't want any of the rest of this stuff. Isn't that bad? Right? You hear people all the time say, well, Christianity is about a relationship, not a religion. Well, yeah. I, mean, I, I get what we mean. I've said it myself. And the reality is uh, Christ established this as a religion. This is why we're here. This is religious activity. So what we're doing is religion. Um, Christ has given it to us. So there is religion involved. Um, and, but this is why Christ Jesus is, is always Pressing in on our motivation. Why do you do what you do? Why do you say you want me, but then in the next breath want nothing to do with me, right? I think that's the difference between the two. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I intended to get here a long time ago and um, got off. So let, let's do this. Let, let's talk about some things that we can pray for specifically. Um, and I have three categories of things here. One is, one is property, one is ministry, and one is just practical, okay? Um, so under the, the property, and I can maybe print this up and send it out at some point if that would be helpful. Um, there are a number of things um, that we either need to do or would like to do as far as the property is concerned. Um, one, a number of you know, because we've started having some conversations about this recently, the 
the back portion of our property, way, way in the back, the part that you can't really see because it's all grown over, um, we, we learned uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, there are a lot of homeless people that have been living back there. Um, and, and so we went back because some of the neighbors have started to complain. Um, the, the cops have been called out a number of times. Uh, we went back to just kind of survey what's going on. Um, there is so much trash back there. It, it is, I've tried to explain it to some people, and, and a few of the guys after our prayer meeting yesterday went out to, to walk around, and even after trying to explain it and showing them some pictures, seeing it in person was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, this is beyond what we could have thought. So um, we need, as a church, to figure out what to do with that back portion of the property. Um, we are we are now going to have to clean it up. Um, we're going to have to consider some way to secure it better than it is currently secured. Um, and, and then there, there's been some mention and some talk about the possibility of can we just break off that portion of the property, sell it, so we don't have to worry about continuing to maintain it. So one of the things we need to pray for is that back acreage, what do we do? Uh, it's about 1.65 acres. Um, what do we do with that? The second thing on the property, this front building um, is just, it's sitting. And as buildings sit and age, they tend to deteriorate. Uh, it was in rough shape when I came 10 years ago. It's not getting better as the law of thermodynamics dictate, right? Uh, it's just going to continue to uh, deteriorate. We, we really need the Lord to bring us an answer about what to do with that building. Um, and and over, the, over the decade that I've been here, there have been so many possibilities that have been brought our way, and just the Lord has not allowed any of them to come to fruition. Uh, I would really love for the Lord to bring an answer to that um, in 2024, whatever that might be. The third thing is our parking lot. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, it's also not getting better. Uh, it, it's slowly deteriorating as well, and, and I would love for the Lord to bring an answer there also. I did look into this about uh, probably about two years ago, and the quote we got was about $125,000 uh, to fix our parking lot. So, so those are kind of property needs um, that are big, that we really need the Lord to direct us in wisdom. We really need him to provide in some ways for us. Uh, ministry needs, and, and folks, I'll just be honest, I could spend, I could spend um, a couple of hours sitting here talking to you about the ministry or the spiritual needs uh, for Holiday Bible Church, um, but I'm just going to try to categorize a, a few of them. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask you to pray uh, that the Lord would continue to purify us as his people, that he would purify us. Um, and secondly, that he would protect us. Uh, there, there is no doubt, folks, Satan is, is uh, he, he's a roaring lion, and he is looking to devour us. Um, I want us to pray that God would protect his people from spiritual attack, spiritual good. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I would like for us to pray for our purity and for our protection spiritually. I would like for us to pray for the gospel reach in our community. Um, I, our desire is that the gospel would impact the community around us. And, and to some degrees over the last 10 years that has happened, but there is so much need. There's so much brokenness. There's so much disillusionment with what people think Christianity is, and people have been burned by things in the past. So um, I would like for you to pray for the gospel reach. And, and very closely attached to that, there are these ministry opportunities and partnerships, some that we already have and some that are kind of on the table as possibilities for us. Um, I, I just, I'll run through a few of them without going into to, to a ton of detail. Um, but we already know as far as the gospel partnership goes, we, we are... We've been supporting the Cross family uh, for six years now, I think. Um, they are now back in the States, um, and, and he has been called as a pastor of a little tiny church in Kissimmee. They cannot support him, um, so they're, they're asking their supporting churches to continue to give uh, while the church is reestablished until it can actually pay uh, and help him support his family. So 
Um, that one, one prayer request is just not only for them and their ministry, but also our relationship with them uh, as we move into 2024 and what that looks like. Um, man, where else do we go from here? We, we've, we, we still have a uh, recovery meeting, meets twice a week or twice a month with um, Gulf Coast Family Resource Center. Uh, they, they bring 20 to 25 individuals almost every, uh, every other Tuesday, um, and they just sit and, and are very responsive. And uh, if, you, if you're paying attention, about every other Sunday, a group of them show up here uh, in our service. And, and if you haven't noticed that yet, um, watch, okay? Because probably next Sunday, there'll probably be a van that pulls up and drops off anywhere between two, and I think last week there were five or six. Uh, set about right here where the pots are. Um, if you see them, man, introduce yourself. They're, they're for the most part, they're they are kind. They are genuinely interested in what Christ has to offer. Um, and as often as they're able to get off campus and come, they are coming. So continue to pray for that ministry. Um, and, and we've looked at a number of other possibilities as far as um, recovery meetings that would be open to the community. Um, we've been approached by other organizations like Pasco Horizon, uh, which, uh, which is going to be a, a conversation coming up here in the near future, an organization called Better Together, another organization called Freedom at Last. Um, there, there's no lack of opportunities for us to invest our time and resources in things that would be both gospel-centered and helpful for our community. Um, but we are limited. We are small. Uh, we need God's direction about what to do. Some, some of our folks are already involved in some of these things. The, the, the West Coast Pregnancy Center. Um, we, we've got involvement there with the jail, with Door of Hope. Like we, We've got people involved, uh, the, the food ministry on Tuesday nights over here for Metropolitan. We've got people involved in a number of different things already. Um, so pray for those opportunities and those partnerships. Uh, what does God want us to do? Um, and what should we be involved in? And that the things that we are already involved in would bear fruit for his glory. Um, and then I would say to pray for the leadership of Holiday Bible Church. That the leadership itself, um, both elders and deacons, two things. Number one would be strengthened. And number two would be multiplied. Um, leadership in the church, sometimes we, we sometimes there's this divide between leadership and, and like congregation. And almost like this, this little... Um, distrustful standoff, right? Like the, the people are not really sure what whether they can trust the the folks that are leading, the folks that are up front. We're always kind of suspicious, and then the people who are leading are kind of looking at the people, going, mm, "We don't know if we can trust them either." Um, and and so there's this weird relationship. Um, but but the reality is, according to the scripture, the, the biblical model of the church is that leadership is a gift to the people of God. Um, and, and so the more, the more people we have qualified to serve in leadership roles, the better for the church. Um, so pray for the strengthening of the leadership and, and ultimately also the multiplication of that leadership. Um, finally, the, the, the practical end of things, and like I said, I could go on and on and on about the, the spiritual ministry end of things, but we'll leave it there and allow the Lord to expound on some of those for you. Practical things. Number one, it's budget time. Uh, we're, we're a little bit behind uh, on, on putting out a budget for you, but we need the Lord's direction about what that budget should look like. Um, we have some needs just in service areas in the church. Um, our, our property maintenance and upkeep, the audiovisual ministry, uh, it's the same people back there pushing the same buttons every week. I don't like that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want the same people to have to do the same thing and, and be involved. I, I would much rather have a rotation. Um, the music ministry, um, all kinds of things, areas in which we could use uh, some some help, some service. Uh, those are kind of more on the practical side of ministry needs. Um, and I think I'll stop there because we're about out of time. And, and like I said, I could go on and on. Those are the things I wanted to at least give to you to go as we're praying. Here it is. Um, and like I said, I can I can take this and maybe send it out in an email. Uh, maybe with the next prayer prompt, I'll include some of these things so you know better how to be praying for Holiday Bible Church. I want to leave you with this, Psalm 131. There's a lot of stuff, okay? That's a lot of things, and some of these things are big things. And the reality is, 
the reason we pray is that we don't have the answers. Right? They're, they're big, lofty things, and we don't know what to do with them. And, and Psalm 131 says this, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things too great or too wondrous for me. Which is kind of where we are. We're looking at 2024 going, these things are too great. I don't know what to do with them. They're beyond me. So what do we do? Verse 2 says, instead, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like a weaned child. Israel, or we might say people of God, put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. In other words, here, here's a passage, a prayer that is wrestling with the reality of uh, already, not yet. Like, like we, we see God's promises, we desire the fulfillment of those promises, but yet we're living in this like, I can't see what's coming. And we have big questions that need to be answered. We have needs that need to be filled. The need for spiritual purity and protection. Guys, we can't, we can't just manipulate that. We, we cannot just make it happen. Um, we, we, they're, they're too wondrous for us. And so the psalmist is like, instead of spending all my energy worrying about how any of that's going to happen, or being overwhelmed by the pressure of it, I just, I just want to take it to you. I want to quiet my soul before you, like a weaned child with his mother. In other words, like like a like a like a small child whose belly is full, standing with the security and the protection of his mother. Not a care in the world, right? Knowing his every need is going to be met. The psalmist is like, that's what I want my soul to be. And in order to do that, we have to put our hope in the Lord, right? Stop getting sucked in by the things that are too great for us. And instead, pray. This is why, and again, the Bible always says, it's, it all says the same thing. So it goes back to Philippians last week. What's the answer to anxiety? It's to pray. How do we intensify our praying? through regular fasting, right? God, we need you. Here are some things we need, but we're also willing to admit we don't even know what we need. <laughs> we don't even know what all that looks like. We just know we need you. All right? Let's make that the, the heartbeat of our pursuit. And now we're overtime. So let me pray for us one last time and let you get out of here. Um, Lord, uh, these things are indeed too great for us. They are too wondrous. And if we give our minds to them, uh, they, they'll drive us crazy. They'll fill us with anxiety. We'll, we'll be like Peter, looking at the winds and the waves, and we'll just start to sink. So Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. May that be really ultimately the point of our praying, that we are, we are looking to you, we are seeking you. And Lord, may our souls be like a satisfied child with his mom close at hand, knowing that all of his needs will be taken care of. God, give us that kind of peace as we pursue you in prayer together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks so much for staying, folks. The Lord bless you. You are dismissed. Oh. <laughs>